All right, let's get this started. Uh, my name is Ryan Davis. I am known pretty much everywhere as Zen Spider, except for Twitter, as you can see. Uh, I'm the independent consultant. I am an independent consultant in Seattle, and I'm a founding member of Seattle RB, which is the first and oldest Ruby group in the world. So, setting some expectations. Uh, this is an introductory talk. Uh, it's very little code in it. Um, I'm not going to teach testing or TDD in this talk. I'm going to be talking about the what and the why, uh, not so much the how. I have 218 slides, which puts me at just under five and a half slides a minute, so I have to go kind of fast. Um, so let's get started. The simplest thing that we can ask is, what is Minitest? Uh, Minitest was originally an experiment to see if I could get test unit replaced uh, for about 50 of my projects that I had at the time. I'm up to about 100 now, uh, with as little code as possible. Um, and I got that to happen in about 90 lines of code. Um, it's currently available as a gem. Uh, we didn't have Ruby gems back then when it was originally written. Um, it now ships with Ruby uh, as of 191 and up. Um, it's meant to be small, clean, and very fast. It's now about 1,600 lines of code, which sounds like a, a really big um, increase over 90, but still that's very small. Uh, it supports unit style, spec style, benchmark style, um, very basic mocking and stubbing, uh, has a very flexible plugin system, and et cetera, as we'll see. There are six main parts of Minitest. Uh, the runner, which really kind of is nebulous now. Um, Minitest, that should say test, uh, which is the TDD API. Minitest spec, which is the BDD API. Minitest mock, pride, and bench. I'm only going to be talking about two parts, Minitest test and Minitest spec. Um, so let's jump into Minitest test, uh, which is the unit testing side of things. So test cases are simple classes that subclass main test test uh, or another test case. And tests are methods that start with test and they make assertions about your code. It's just classes and methods and method calls all the way down. Everything is as straightforward as you get and it is magic free. That slide is uh, two years old so this wasn't a, a, a wasn't my only uh, bar bit, no. Um, so Mintest test includes the usual assertions that you would expect from XUnit, um, plus several added beyond what XUnit and TestUnit uh, usually provide. Methods marked with a plus are new to Minitest, and methods marked with a star do not have uh, negative or reciprocals, as we'll see in a sec. Unlike TestUnit, Minitest provides a lot more negative assertions. Um, it doesn't provide some that you might expect, which I'll go into later. Um, but one of the questions is like, why are there so many pluses? I really want my code, tests included, to communicate to me and other readers as clearly as possible. Not only does the code communicate better, but the error messages are much more customized, so when there is something wrong, I get better information about it. And finally, uh, assert equal is uh, enhanced to do intelligent diff mode. It allows you to see what's actually changed instead of a huge blob on the left side and a huge blob on the right. You get to actually see what's different between the two. But I said that I would describe why some negative assertions are missing. Uh, this is something that I hear a lot more than I'd actually like to hear. Um, the question of where is refute raises or assert not raised. It's the same place as a refute silent. So let's look at that. Let's highlight the key components of refute silent. So refute silent says that this block of code must print something. What it is, I don't care. That is a valueless assertion. What you should be asserting for is a specific output that you want. In the same vein, refute raises says that this block of code must do something. What it is, I don't care. Um, it's a valueless assertion again. Instead, you should be asserting for the specific result or side effect that you actually intend. I've heard the argument, but it's useful. No, it isn't. It implies side effects and our return values have already been checked or aren't important, which is always false because you wouldn't be writing code otherwise. Uh, it falsely bumps your code coverage metrics and it gives you a false sense of security. Uh, I'm an ex-lifeguard. I lifeguarded in my um, high school days at uh, uh, various lakes in my county. And one of the things we really feared were parents with kids with water wings. 
because the parents think they've got flotation devices and we'll just talk to our friends and ignore our kids and watch them drown like this. Um, so in other words, this only makes it look like something has been tested when in fact it hasn't had any tested applied to it at all. I've heard it's more expressive. No, it's not. Writing the test itself was the act of expression. It's an explicit contract in every single test framework out there that any unhandled exception is an error by definition. The test's mere existence states there are no unhandled exceptions via these pathways. And I've been having <clears throat> these arguments for years. In fact, I had this argument last month. And I know that some people will never be convinced. And honestly, that's OK. You can't win them all. But it doesn't mean I can't try. So hold on your hats. Stand back. I'm going to try one more time to convince all of you. It's like if you call it, it must be OK, right? So I wrote all these extra assertions to verify that everything is OK. Uh, and if you'd like to license this code, come please see me after this talk. Um, if only that were possible, our jobs would be so much easier. Next up is my test spec, uh, the example testing side. Uh, in short, where Minitest test is a testing API, Minitest spec is a testing DSL. Instead of defining classes and methods, you use a DSL to declare your examples. Test cases are describe blocks that contain a bunch of tests. Tests are it blocks that call a bunch of expectation methods. Here's an example uh, that is equivalent to the previous one. Um, so we have describe instead of class. We have it instead of def test. Um, but in reality, describe blocks really are classes, and it blocks really are methods. This same example, one to one, transforms into this code where describe makes a class, it makes a method, there is no magic. All of your normal OO design code uh, uh, tools exist and they work as normal, which is really, really important. It means that include works, def works, everything is as, expect, as you expect. You're just using a slightly different language. Similar mini test test, mini test spec has uh, many expectations defined and a similar set of negative expectations and a similar set of missing culprits. And all of this is gained for free because each one maps from expectation to assertion directly. Underneath mini test test and mini test spec is the infrastructure to run your tests. And it does so in a way that helps promote more advanced and robust testing. Mini test has randomization baked in and has always been on by default. Uh, it helps uh, prevent test order dependencies and keep your tests robust and working standalone. Uh, by rule, every single one of your tests down to the lowest level should be able to run by itself and pass. If it requires another test to run before it, it's not standalone, it's not a unit, and it's wrong, it's buggy. Uh, and as far as I know, Minitest was the first test framework to have randomized run order. Um, there's an opt-in system that lets you promote a test case to be parallelized during the run. And that takes randomization to a whole nother level. It ensures thread safety in your uh, libraries and absolute robustness, because if it can handle the parallelization, it can handle anything. The original mini test was a tiny 90 lines of code. And over time, features have been uh, added that you get to choose to help you enhance your tests. Um, it's still really small in comparison, but it's incredibly powerful. So what was my reasoning for Minitest design? Minitest is not special in any way, shape, or form. All of my usual tropes apply. If you've heard me up here ranting and raving, Minitest is no different. Uh, first and foremost, it's just Ruby. It's classes and methods and method calls. Everything is as straightforward as you can get. I believe that less is more. If I can do something in less code, I will, absolutely. Method dispatch is always going to be the slowest thing in Ruby. Uh, more importantly, less code is almost always more understandable than more code. So let's take a look. Here is a cert in delta, which is the equivalent of a cert equal, but for floats. Uh, never, ever use a cert equal on floats, and never use floats for money. Um, there, I've done my usual caveats. Uh, it's as simple as possible with minor optimizations. Uh, in this case, we use uh, a block to delay the uh, error message rendering. Uh, in the case that we don't have an error, we shouldn't have that cost. Uh, and really, this just boils up, um, on up to a cert. So you really only need to know 
um, about 15 other lines of code to understand how this works as a whole. Indirection is the enemy. I want errors to happen as close to the real code as possible. I don't want things delayed. And I don't want layers of indirection in between. Uh, I kind of feel like Noel is making my point because he just kept talking about the layers of indirection that RSpec adds over and over. Uh, I want to strip all of those out, as many as possible at least. I want the responsibility to lie in the right place. No managers necessary, no coordination going on. I want objects to be responsible for their own duties. Uh, this may not be the best example. I don't know how to get a good example of indirection as the enemy because it's rather hard to show what you don't do. Um, must equal is an expectation that directly calls assert equal on the current test context. And then assert equal is three lines long, if I remember right. And that's it. No magic allowed. Even test discovery avoids object space. It has minimal metaprogramming in it, and it uses plain classes and methods to do all of its work. Um, I originally wrote Minitest in part to see if I could, um, because I was the maintainer of test unit at the time, and test unit terrified me. Um, but I also wrote it because I was working on Rubinius, and I wanted Rubinius and JRuby and other uh, implementations of Ruby that hadn't finished being a full Ruby to have the simplest implementation of a test framework possible so they could get feedback quickly. And finally, it has a thriving plugin ecosystem. I designed Minitest to be extensible so that Minitest itself could remain minimal. Uh, here are just a, a small amount of the popular uh, plugins for Minitest. Okay, so what does this have to do with Rails? Well, the official Rails stack uses Minitest. Each release, it peels back the testing onion, encouraging better testing practices. Except that peeling onions makes you cry, right? Um, hopefully not in the case of Minitest. So Rails 4.0 was the first version to cut over from test units to Minitest, and they did so on the Minitest 4.x line. Um, at the time, I had already declared that I wasn't going to keep updating uh, standard lib mini tests to mini test 5. I was only going to maintain it at level f uh, version 4. And that's because test unit is built on top of mini test and has a lot of hooks into the internals, and it just made it really hard for me to ever update and not break their stuff. So I put a freeze on that. So Rails updated to mini test 4 to remove a layer of complexity and indirection but also to allow them a migration path to Minitest 5. Because Test Unit was already wrapping Minitest, there was basically no impact on anyone. Um, arguably, there may have even been an almost imperceptible performance improvement, um, but I'm not going to claim that there was one. Rails 4.1 switched to the Minitest 5 line. Uh, this was painful for Rails itself because of crufty tests and the number of monkey patches that they had on Minitest itself. Um, this got Rails onto the newer code base, um, the active development line of Minitest, and it made things easier to do like um, exec-based isolation tests. Uh, there's a number of tests in Rails, or each test actually forks a process to run a separate Rails app by itself so that if they're running in parallel, they're not going to infect each other. As painful as it might have been to get Rails switched to it in passing, you hopefully never noticed, though. However, Rails 4.2 turned off the alphabetical order of the testing and uh, to remove a monkey patch. Um, and that started to run tests in random order. Uh, this is solely to improve the quality of Rails's and your tests. Um, but it may have had some impact on, on some people. We did get some reports that uh, after updating, uh, people started having tests that previously passed fail. Um, I had to isolate a number of test bugs in Rails itself uh, because of this. Uh, and I'm going to say, honestly, despite the pain that it causes, this is a good thing. Test order dependency bugs are problematic, and they're incredibly hard to track down. I'm going to talk later about a tool that can help identify these bugs. Uh, and hopefully future versions of Rails, they should be tracking many tests. Uh, Aaron Patterson and I keep those things in sync, uh, and he lets me know when things are coming uh, down the pipe. So as a Rails dev, what does all of this mean? Uh, hopefully, if I've done my job right, it means nothing. Um, you shouldn't even have to see many tests most of the time unless you want to enhance it with some plugins. And that's because you're subclassing Rails's test cases, like active support test case or action controller test case. There's about six of them, if I remember right. There might be more now. And the basic architecture looks something like this. 
Uh, you write your own test class that subclass is active support test case, and active support test case subclasses may test test. Uh, it provides things like per test database transactions, so you don't have to clean up. Uh, you just add a bunch of records. They're going to be gone on the next test. Um, Aaron and I wound up adding uh, before and after setup and teardown hooks to make it easy for Rails and other libraries or frameworks to extend many tests to do extra wrappings that they needed to do. Uh, it provides things like fixers to uh, load test data, uh, declarative forms if you like that instead. Uh, if you don't like those, you can just use def. And it provides extra assertions like assert difference, assert valid keys, assert deprecated, and assert nothing raised. Wait, what? Don't worry. This is the actual implementation of assert nothing raised. Uh, it's only there for compatibility's sake. Uh, and personally, I think that it should be deprecated and removed. Maybe that should be for Rails 5. Um, <clears throat> and all this means that you can write uh, simple tests that describe your current task. Things like database transactions don't have to clutter your test code. Uh, and you can focus on what the test is really trying to do. This is a, a very simple example, and I think all of these test examples come from the uh, testing section of the Rails guide online. Action controller test case is another Rails extension, uh, except that its subclass is active support test case, so you get all of those goodies layered on. Um, and it extends it to include more, like all of your usual HTTP verbs, uh, simulate web server state, and provide assertions specific to handling requests, which lets you easily write uh, clean functional tests like the following. I love air conditioning. I'm so dry right now. I'm just going to leave the lid off. <clears throat> Active dispatch integration test provides full controller to controller integration tests. Uh, as usual, it subclasses active support test case, so all of the usual stuff is there. It provides a ton of assertions that I cannot fit onto one slide and allows you to write comprehensive integration tests that span multiple controllers. If you want more details about all the stuff that Rails adds on top of many tests, you can get that here, and it's described uh, in pretty good detail. It's actually uh, a really good read. So Rails's approach to subclass many test tests leads to a very simple setup that remains very powerful, providing you with uh, everything you need for unit tests all the way up to integrations. It leverages Minitest power, providing randomization, optional parallelization, to provide better testing, make your tests that you write better and more robust over time. But what happens when something goes wrong? Perhaps you want to use spec style. Turns out the DHH disapproves of our spec so much that he wouldn't allow us to switch uh, the test framework um, in Rails to many test spec. He, re he reverted that commit. Um, as I understand it, he simply doesn't want people to submit patches using spec style, so he didn't want it easily available. But that doesn't mean that you're stuck. If you prefer spec style, that's totally fine. You can use Mike Moore's many test Rails or Ken Collins's many test spec Rails to do varying degrees of this type of code. Um, the two libraries are not the same. They suggest slightly different styles. One tracks our specs um, style a bit more than the other. Or perhaps you upgraded to Rails 4.2 and now you have failures. Also known as, Ryan, you broke all my shit. I'm sorry. Um, unfortunately, that's not as simple to deal with. It is a bit harder. But again, it is a good thing to catch and fix this sooner rather than later. Why are my buttons not working? Uh, it is a test order dependency bug. Um, and quite simply, that simply means that tests will pass when they're run in a particular order, say A before B, but not when B runs before A. And if it was only three tests, that wouldn't be a problem. It would be pretty easy to find and fix. But you probably have hundreds and hundreds of tests. That's not so easy uh, until a few months ago. Uh, I wrote Minitest Bisect to try to isolate the problems that we were having getting Rails on a Minitest randomization. Uh, it helps you isolate and debug random test failures. In short, it intelligently runs and reruns your tests, whittling it down uh, until the culprits are minimized. And here we're going to see uh, a simple example of it running. Um, ignore the fact that I'm pre-specifying the seed. Pretend that I'm running this anew and we get this failure. We get the failure. We grab the random seed, and we rerun the test using Minitest Bisect instead. That's going to rerun the entire test suite to ensure that it is reproducible. 
And once it is, it starts to bisect uh, the culprit space down to the minimal subset. And you can see that it speeds up dramatically as it goes on. Getting it down to two tests run in a particular order that will cause the repro every time. I see I'm not alone with this problem. <laughs> or maybe you're just used to kitchen sink development. For starters, just try it. It might work. Things like Mocha and a lot of testing libraries already work in many tests, and they're just fine. Uh, otherwise, you're not alone. Um, and someone probably beat you to it. So look for the existing plugins that are listed in many tests. Read me, or search on rubygems.org, or Stack Overflow, or whatever. But my suggestion, and I know this is going against the flow here, try less complicated testing. Only bring in plugins once you've decided that you really, really need them. Otherwise, start fresh and clean. Try it. You might like it. Uh, but the problem is that change takes time. Just remember that you might want to measure the before and after in order to be more objective about this uh, change. Um, I've only got anecdotes of projects speeding up when they switch to mini tests. Um, I would love more data, and if you would submit that to me, that'd be great. I have heard that people have halved their test times by switching from RSpec to Minitest, but again, I don't have anything objective. So all of this Minitest stuff sounds interesting, but why should I bother? The first argument is this. I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, to me, you're a lost cause. There's plenty of data showing that the benefits of testing, and if you can't, can't get past that, um, I'd rather help other people. Uh, I'm going to pick my battles. Thanks. Like this one. This is a battle I want to pick every time. <clears throat> Obviously, not everyone uses it. The official Rails, ta uh, Rails stack uses it, which means DHH uses it. Tenderlove uses it. Jeff Casimir and his cohort teach many tests at the Turing School. Nokogiri, Hamel God, New Relic, SQLite, and a bunch of other very popular gems use it. Uh, in fact, there's more than 4,000 gems that declare dependencies on Minitest. And unfortunately, because Minitest ships in standard lib, um, there are plenty of gems that don't declare their dependency on it. So I'm sure there's plenty more. So what are the real functional differences between Minitest and RSpec? Being test frameworks, there's plenty of overlap, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, where they are unique, though, is where it gets interesting. To be fair, RSpec provides a lot more than many tests. Uh, things like test metadata and metadata filtering, um, more hooks like before and around, um, implicit subject, described class, fancier mocking, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, it's fancier. Minitest, by definition, doesn't offer as much. Some of the stuff that it made it unique has been adopted, like randomization. Um, but benchmarking, parallelization, and speed are the main distinguishing features. Basically, it's simpler and more pragmatic and snarky. <laughs> so it's the cognitive differences with RSpec is where things really start to diverge. And this is where I think that Noel's talk actually proves my point quite a bit. Myron Marston, uh, a few years back, wrote a really great response on Stack Overflow comparing RSpec and Minitest. It was a bit biased, but honestly, I think that it was rather fair. The problem is that it's really long, and the meat of it uh, is in this first paragraph here. Um, but even it's pretty long, and apparently I've been working with TenderLab for too long, uh, whose attention span is that of a ferret on methamphetamine. <laughs> um, so there's so much there that I have a hard time dealing with it all at once. So let's focus on that one paragraph. I'm going to color code it red for the RSpec points and blue for mini test. I'm not going to read that crap. I've read it too many times. <clears throat> so Myron thinks this is why RSpec is great. And I think that this is everything that's wrong with RSpec. And we're both right. Philosophically, we're both right. We have different goals, and we have different perspectives on what good is. So back to that paragraph. Let's try to boil this down even more for the ADD. Uh, even that's pretty long, so let's break it down to a simple table. Example groups, 
Uh, Minitest compiles blocks down to simple classes where RSpec, and I'm paraphrasing this here because he didn't say what it did, reifies testing concepts into first class objects. And that first word, I think, is the big red flag for me with regard to RSpec. If you're using that word, you should be coding in ha uh, Haskell. Uh, examples, Minitest compiles uh, it blocks down into simple methods, whereas they use first class objects. Um, Minitest uses inheritance or mixins for reuse, where they use uh, shared behaviors for first class constructs. And um, simple methods for making assertions for expectations versus first class matcher objects. But even that's pretty long. So let's boil it down further. Minitest uses a class, they use a first class object. Minitest uses a method, they use a first class object. Minitest uses subclasses or include, they use a first class object. And Minitest uses method calls, they use a first class object. <laughs> first class simply means that you can assign a, something to a variable and you can use it the way you can use any other value. And it just so happens that everything that Minitest uses is Ruby, and, and nearly everything in Ruby is first class, so that's not a good distinction. Everywhere that I could use Ruby's mechanisms, I did. And everywhere that RSpec could reinvent, they did. So let's try to take a look at this and see where this starts to get more cognitively complex. I think this is best illustrated by examining how RSpec works. Here we have two nested describes. Uh, each one has a before block, and each one has a single example. Um, yet the before blocks seem to be inherited, and the examples are not. There'll be exactly two runs here, where the first one uses one before, and the second one uses two befores. So our A and B classes is nesting like subclassing. What's, what's the analogy we can use to understand this? Well, if they're classes, and nesting is like subclassing, then we need to, uh, we need this undef method to ensure that we don't inherit any tests from our superclasses. This is the approach that Minitest uses, and it sucks. But that's the runtime uh, behavior that uh, our spec users expected out of Minitest spec, and that was something that I wound up having to put in. What about this analogy? Are before and after like included modules? If that's the case, then we don't have to undef any methods, but instead we need to generate a bunch of inner modules and have a bunch of includes, and setups need to intelligently call super, and because of the complexity, this sucks too. This is basically another object model. Uh, to effectively use RSpec, you need to learn a whole separate object model that sits on top of Ruby's object model. This is doubly confusing if you haven't already learned the Ruby object model, or if you're just trying to learn both at the same time, you're gonna get overwhelmed. What ends up happening is it encourages users to hand wave. Noobs are just, using, just learning Ruby. They don't have the time or the ability to dig in and learn both object models, and it, it encourages users to hand wave the oddities away. What else are you gonna do? So it encourages them to not know what describe and it or actually are or do, and if you didn't see the previous talk, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on inside those describes and its. Basically says, here's the magic incantation to do X. So when you're a beginner, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, thanks to Arthur C. Clarke. So now I need to rename my talk. <laughs> Sorry, Noel, but our spec is magic. So from that previous post from Myron, he said that many people find it to be overkill, and there is an added a, a cognitive cost to these extra abstractions. Indeed. Here are the raw numbers of that added cognitive cost. Don't bother grokking these numbers. We're going to visualize them uh, in the next slide for both uh, the flog line and the comments plus code line. Um, flog is a complexity metric proportional to how hard something is to test, to debug, or even to understand. And here, our spec is 6.6 .6 times bigger. And this is the combined meat of the projects. This is code plus comments, and it's basically how much you're going to have to read to understand each library. At 8.5 times bigger, it's akin to reading Dr. Seuss versus James Joyce. 
Do you like my Dr. Seuss font? I think I faked that really well. <laughs> so back to that added cognitive cost. As we're going to see in a second, it's not just cognitive cost. There are performance differences as well. All those abstractions, reinventing the wheel, it has a real cost. Here we have some fairly complex plots. Uh, this shows the runtime in solid lines and the amount of memory allocated in dashed. Uh, the green lines are 100% passing, the red lines are 100% failing, and the others are in between that. Uh, and as you may notice, there's a slight problem to these charts. Can anyone guess? They're not using the same scale. So now you can see that this is a severe and painful difference between RSpec and main test. Failures have exponential growth in RSpec. Runtime is always near zero in many tests. Memory is linear, and it's always lower. But Ryan, who cares? Passing our spec is fast enough. Indeed, I actually agree with that. Everything is bread and roses as long as everything plays nice. But what happens when it isn't? You have a bug, or you refactor, or anything else goes wrong. Well, oftentimes, when I'm refactoring stuff, I'm going to make a change, and I'm going to have 100 tests fail. All of a sudden, you pay. For completeness, the speed of the actual assertions in both systems are purely linear. The speed of running those tests at the, the method level uh, is also linear. And because they're linear, please do not try to regain any speed by reducing examples or expectations or otherwise reducing the quality of your tests. Um, if you want to speed up, many tests will always be faster than RSpec, pretty much by definition. So you can switch to many test, um, or you can never, ever refactor or have any bugs. So in summary, at the end of the day, as long as you test, I don't actually care what you use. Use the best tool for your job. Hopefully I've shown the technical merits of many tests. Choose what works for you, not because it seems popular. <clears throat> Oftentimes I hear that uh, they chose RSpec because there's more documentation available for it. But maybe there's fewer articles about many tests because there's less need for them. Many tests is much easier to understand. You can read it in a couple hours and understand it head to toe. So maybe many test users aren't missing. Maybe they're just busy getting stuff done. Choose what works for you. Who knows? Try it. You might like it. After all, it's just Ruby. Thank you, and hire me. <laughs>